We're live on YouTube. Okay, I just had to get that started. All right, see, I, I made this. I made this with my 3D printer, and oh. it. it's actually there's like it's all it's all different it's all different pieces. I had to glue them together and stuff. It was it was kind of fun. You're Look a crafty guy, John. Well, not really, but sometimes I am. <laughs> <laughs> I look at this picture and I realize I really need to dust this shelf. Geez, those Batmobiles are dusty. I need to go clean them up. So, oh well. But yeah, it was kind of neat. It's like translucent resin. It's a resin thing, you know. So you have to paint it as well. Oh, I see. Oh, that. Oh, the uh, the body part is okay. So what about the like yeah. the cape and stuff? Did you paint it? It was it was all clear. It's all translucent because that's all I had at right. the moment kicking around. So yeah, I painted everything that's black. I painted and the yellow belt. I painted. So you really are crafty. I you, just, you I just left take the credit where credit is due. Go on. Wait, wait. <laughs> did you make those cars too? No, I didn't make the cars. <laughs> I <didn't> <laughs> purchased the cars. <laughs> Can you make a ventilator cool. too? I can't. I, I no. I cannot no. make a ventilator. It's a very. It's a small little three D printer. Um, yeah, how, it doesn't make. How tall is this guy? This whole guy is maybe five inches tall. I guess. Wow. Well, that's almost uh, to scale. Almost to scale, yeah, yeah, almost. So, okay. Anyway, Very cool. it, it was fun. I thought I'd share. Well, we have to have fun in life. That's that's kind of that seems to be the theme today. And it is theoretically yeah. a day off today. It's a holiday for many people. So. And for whatever reason, that cape it took like ten hours to print the cape. Ten huh. hours. That seemed like a long time. It seemed like a long time to me. Yeah. Oh, is that a separate piece? Yeah, the cape was separate. The head was separate, the gloves were separate, and the boots were separate. Yeah, it was fun. Anyway, that would make, okay, hey. Yeah. yeah. That would make painting easier with those separate pieces. You wouldn't have to follow the lines so much. <laughs> exactly. I had to follow the lines of the belt, but that was in, in the uh, mask. So, anyway, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everybody out there. And, Clarion Live Land. This is the Clarion Live Weekly Webinar. See it and learn it and share it. This is webinar number 557. When will they ever stop? Today is April the 10th, 2020. The Clarion date is 80092. All webinars are recorded and available at clarionlive.com. Please join us on Skype. And we are, in fact, live streaming on YouTube. We have four people watching this right now. So thanks. You have hosts for today's webinar. Arnold is with us today. I heard him. I heard him speaking just a moment ago, and he's, he's no longer speaking. John, that's me. I'm here. Lisa is here. Hello, Lisa. Hello, everybody. Bruce is with us today. Hello, Bruce. Hello, everyone. And Mr. Hansen, Mike, is with us today. No piano. Like, no, yeah, well, I had other preparations to do. I, can, I, I can't um, do everything in one day. Come on, gotta <laughs> spread out the love here a little bit. You can't John, present I'm, and play at the same time. I'm not sure we're seeing your screen. Are we not seeing my screen? Darn, are you kidding me? I clicked it. I I did. Still looking at Yen and Batman. That. Well, let's see. well, we got the verbal version. We just didn't get the visuals to go with it. Yeah, you know what? I'm going to go back. Just, it's just so it's there. There it is. Okay. That's what I think you missed, really. Oh, I just well, like the right. clarion dates. They're so easy. <laughs> so easy right now, right? Yeah. Um, so, yes, so we have a full bobble headset with us today. That's what I was. Is that possible? It's not only possible, it's happened. It's happening at this very moment. Rules of the webinar, all attendees to meet means you can't hear your type questions, 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 and finally, stay home and stay safe. So change the rule a little bit. We want to flatten the curve, but we also want to stay home. Stay safe. California and Wa state of Washington are doing a good job. I'm doing my part. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think I need to go get myself a 3D printer and stay home. <laughs> well, you can have it delivered. Yeah, you don't have. You can actually well, stay home and still get a 3D player and let the essential people, like the shippers, stay healthy. Yeah, and they say, "How essential is your 3D printer?" <laughs> <laughs> it's essential. I'm telling you, it's essential. 
Yeah, wouldn't it be interesting if all the stuff you order online, they ask you a question of, is this an essential purchase just to try and track it? And you say, yeah, everything's, everything's essential to me. I guess you have to look at, at the bigger picture. So, need versus so, want. So Mr. Riffy was asking me, uh, winning the game with Clarion, what the heck does that mean? And I told him. Good title. I like this title. Is that a good title? I you thought it to show up. Yeah, let's see. I thought I thought that was a clever title. Clever. Indeed. Coming soon. What do we got? Um, nothing, and then nothing, and nothing. And then, but in May, Bruce says he's going to finally, after years in development, years and years, release Sequin Seven, which is supposed to have all sorts of neat, neat, cool, fun things. It's supposed to. Some people say. It's supposed to. Are you, uh, are you working to the release or working to the feature set, Bruce? Um, so, so, <laughs> John, yeah, we've, got, we've got a hard date now, <laughs> so it must well, be well, to release. Uh, well, why, don't it, <laughs> why don't you be more direct, John? So, yeah, <laughs> I would have... say if you release to a date or you release to a feature set, you can't do both. Um, right. But with, the problem with the second is that we have to have a superset of the feature set in Secret and Six. I mean, otherwise, it's not going to work so well. So we will release on the date. However, we may not target upgrades immediately. So what I may do, depending on how things work, is I may roll it out in stages. So for someone who's a new user, um, or someone who wants to use an web app, you know, that kind of thing, um, and then kind of when it's a superset of sequence six, we can then bring people over. And indeed, even there, I mean, you may be using some of sequence six, but not other parts. So it, it may be a staggered rollout for, for upgrades. We'll, we'll wait and see. I, I don't know how much won't be in it. I mean, the goal obviously is to have everything in it. Um, and there certainly is a large chunk of that already. Um, but we'll see how, we'll see how it plays out. But yes, sometime in May, I'm hoping, well, you know, what I'm hoping and what will happen are two different things. So. <laughs> so, so we'll see. But but definitely we need to get the ball rolling. I'm with you. I'm excited. So here, oh, there's the conference coming up. I was um I was reading some articles today about this this virus thing. You might have heard of it. It's kind of a worldwide thing. And returning to normalcy, what that's going to look like. And Just yeah, it's going to be interesting, but I think I still think this date might well be okay. Might well be okay. I, I'm I'm hopeful, not necessarily confident. If that makes sense, <laughs> that's a, a good description. Uh, yeah. So so currently October eight to eleven is is what we have penciled in. Obviously, um, that is contingent on uh, travel being being kind of open. Um, and I guess it needs to be open a little bit before because you know we're not going to be able to wait until October seventh to to decide no. how to get you. So yeah, we'd probably be looking to see that travel is kind of up and running, beginning of September there and thereabouts, um, sometime in August maybe. Um, let's see how it plays out. Uh, obviously, it's still some time away. Um, there are a number of possible in games in play. Um, and it's unfortunately yes. not just like uh, like we could uh, we could go back to work after this lockdown, but that doesn't mean they're going to open the borders. And I think a lot of countries um, have got closed borders at the moment, and it kind of makes sense to keep them closed until you know the the virus is basically eradicated. Um, so we'll have to wait and see how that all plays out. Obviously, we don't have a crystal ball at this stage, but the dates that are penciled in, the dates that are kind of booked at the hotel and so on is October 8th through 11. Um, and let's see how it goes. I agree. So I, I would, I guess I would recommend not booking flights. Yeah, I'm not even sure you can book flights. But, but yeah, <laughs> I mean, you, you wouldn't book flights Maybe. until until we're more aware of, of what's what's available, you know, in terms yeah. of being able to get you and, and so on. So um, right. um, yeah, I think flights will come later. 
Yeah, but uh, it's many, many months away, like you said. So, and I think people are anxious to get the world started again, but we need to do it in a safe manner. So we'll see if we can balance those two needs and go from there. All right, just to remind you that we would have just gotten back from that this week. Had the, yeah, the world, exactly. Had the world behaved. <laughs> had, the world, had the world been normal, we would have actually just finished up, so yeah. And what's amazing is I got a huge amount of stuff done in the last two weeks. So if I had been off carousing about, I, uh, I would be getting back, trying to figure out how to get my head back into the space of working and then actually getting stuff done. So uh, there are benefits, pros and cons to every single situation. That's true. True that. All right, announcements. We have, uh, we had some meetings this week. Let's see, I don't know if Andy's here. No, but Andy did release his calendar update. And I know that because it showed up and updated this morning, which was cool. I'm getting I'm getting alerts, which is nice. So uh, there was a user group meeting and Andy is getting better and feeling better. And that's what happened. That's that's up on the YouTube site if you want to see what happened there. Claire and I, we had an open webinar. Can't recall what we spoke of. <laughs> Bruce was there. I'm sure he's in the same position. I think I was there. So I can't remember there. if I was we there. there. We had just like everybody <laughs> you know, that's there. That's right. We did. We had everybody there. <laughs> well, we did a couple of net talk questions, and uh, with with Bruce right. saying that if they didn't show up the next day with more questions, he was going to admonish them. But uh, hey. I'm not sure if that happened. But uh, yeah, so that again, that's also on YouTube. But there was a net talk user group meeting. It was a short one this time. It was not. It was not it long. It was short. A couple of little questions. Uh, talk about the, we've had three bolts in the last week or so. So um, a little chat about that and and yeah, up and running. And that is also on the YouTube Clarion Live YouTube channel. I guess I guess Bruce has has not been posting them up them up on the <laughs> official game. Slack. Been slack lately. Yeah, so I that's need, right. I need to catch up. They can find them. They're recorded live and they're available immediately right there on the Clarion Live website. So you can always catch them there. And I think that's all we got. That's all we got going. So, Mike, how do we win the game? Well, we'll, uh, we'll take a look here. I'm the kind of person where I, I don't play a lot of video games. I used to play more when I was a kid, uh, but uh, now I just let my kids play them and me go, why are they wasting so much of their life? But I, but I do play the occasional little game. Um, but I find I, I get very frustrated if, if the game becomes either too difficult or too much of a, of a waste of my time. Um, and the most common games I, I play, I play the occasional little puzzle game, but but the, the, the ones that I really prefer playing are, are tower defense games. <clears throat> Do you guys know what tower defense games are? No. No. Oh, okay. A tower defense game, uh, conceptually, is one in which uh, some number of enemies are going to go through some path, um, usually uh, some circuitous path in the screen, but it could be just towards you, it could be, it could be anything. Um, and you have some number of weapons that you can use to fight these foes that are that are trouncing through the situation. Uh, and you have ability, as, as you go through the game, you get additional abilities, you get the option of, of uh, maybe upgrading some of your weapons and things like this. So I, I've played a wide variety of different kinds of tower defense games. One of the most famous ones, if you're interested, is called Field Runners. And it's quite cute because it's got little, little animated characters running around the screen and you've got these cute little guns and missiles and cannons and such things. But more recently, I happened to play this, this series of different little tower defense games called Mini TD. And there was Mini TD, and there was Mini TD2, and then I came to Mini TD3, and each of them was a little bit different in terms of how it, how it approached it. But Mini TD3 in particular seemed very, very mathematical to me. Uh, its graphics are very, very simple, and I'm going to grab the screen and show you a screenshot and, and just a little bit of gameplay up on YouTube here. So I'm going to change presenter over to me. And um, is this the screen I want? Yep, that's the one. So this is a still shot, and I'm going to start it playing here. So what you'll see is uh, down at the bottom here are all the different weapons. So there's a there's a gun which he's placing some guns, and there's missiles there, 
he's placing a missile and there's a laser beam he can place laser beams and then this last one that he can place is, is basically a, a multiplier so you'll notice each of the weapons cost 50 and the multiplier currently costs 100. Uh, the gun is is kind of cute it's very short range it's just just the the very adjacent blocks it can hit those ones <clears throat> the missiles can go sort of one thing more they got a kind of a wider range um, and then finally when you get something like this this laser that's in the bottom here this last one it can go quite far it can you can you can sort of have it three away from something and go bang 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 and it's a very large range that it can hit as this laser beam shooting now there's this an additional factor you'll see he's just placed now a, a one of those power up things and suddenly these guys instead of being one each they're now doing uh, a double damage all things that are adjacent to this booster thing. So each of these guys has different damage he does. The, the little gun that, that has short range, he can actually shoot and, and do f a five of damage. The missile can do eight of damage, and this laser can do 25 of damage. It's very, very powerful. The, the issue though is the little gun can go bang, 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 almost like a machine gun. It recharges every 0.3 of a time unit. Uh, the missile, takes a little longer to shoot. He can only recharge and shoot every 1.5 time units. And then this big powerful laser, he can only shoot once every five time units, whatever time unit you choose. So I had gone through and played a whole bunch of levels in this thing and I, I gotten through them all. And, and depending upon how well you do, the, the goal is to not let the guys get all the way through the whole path and to the end, because if they make it all the way through to the end, then you start losing hearts. You'll notice you've got 20 hearts up here. So the goal is to manage to, to have all the levels, and here we've got 15 of 30 have already been played. All of these levels, you want to fend off all of your enemies and never allow them to get any guys into your home base. And if you can do that, you get three stars. If a couple of guys get in, you might get two, guys, two stars. Fewer than that, but at least you got through all the levels without losing all your hearts, you get one star. So the real goal is you want to you wanna get through this whole thing. You want to never let anybody get in. So I played all the levels, I uh, like all the different boards that they have, I played through them all. And there were a few of them where I could not uh, achieve three stars, regardless of how much I played them. You know, I'd play them four or five, six times, and I'd go, why in the world can't I find the right combination? And, and I suddenly realized, it, it, it's playing this out so mathematically that if I wrote a little computer program that went through and said, okay, what are all the possible things I could put in each of these spots? How much of an impact would it, would it have on each of these squares? How might I model this thing in a Clarion program so that I could get an optimal situation? <laughs> And the first idea I had is I figured, okay, I'm just going to write something that's going to go to every single square that you could put something in. You could say, what are, what are all the possibilities for this? All the possibilities for that? All the possibilities for that? The problem is there are on this particular board, I think um, uh, it's nine wide by 11 high. So there are 99 squares on this particular board, and that's the maximum. Uh, let's say that there's 70. Uh, that you could actually position uh, weapons onto because the rest is path. Uh, if you look at that, that would be essentially four to the power of 70. That is a massively huge number. That would take so long to process that to th consider one board. I realized I can't just do it brute force. I can't just say, let's just do all possibilities and try and accurately score what's the best the, the best thing we could do there's no way I could do that so I had to come up with a better way of doing it so I thought well let's just start whittling away at the problem like any any program if you if you just say I'm not going to try and conceptualize this entire thing up front I'm going to develop in an, in an agile way I am going to write some unit tests I'm going to try and model aspects of this thing and see if I can as I go through it build something without really knowing what I'm going to build, uh, just to solve problems as they come up in, in a unit test situation. So this is what we're going to go through and take a look at how I solved this particular issue. Uh, so we will stop that for the moment and minimize that. So here is, as, as usual, what I'm going to do this, I have to create a unit test app. And the way you do this is you create just any a normal Clarion DLL. I like to call it unit tests. And, uh, and once you create that, um, uh, the, the steps to do that, you just create a DLL like you'd normally create a DLL. And we could even create another one here just to show you how that's done. Let's just create one real quickly here. I'll open another instance of Clarion. And let's create a new solution. 
And just so that you know the steps involved in this, and I'm going to uh, create a Windows 32. Uh, where are we here? Application is what I want. Uh, and then let's just create that in the same directory in uh, unit tests two. And we're gonna create that. And we don't need a dictionary, it's gonna be a DLL, so we don't need a first procedure, and it's gonna be a DLL, and you hit okay. And here's our empty thing. We have to go into global extensions, and we have to insert a, a unit test global extension. So here's Clarion test is what it's called. And I'm trying to, I'm not sure where the best place is to download this at the moment. We can go hunting for it and find it a little later here. But um, uh, so you add that global thing. If you happen to be calling the DCL library, this is the uh, Dave Harms uh, uh, set of libraries. Normally I turn that off because I because I'm not working in something that's using that, but occasionally it's helpful. Uh, if you have, you, you could specify all of your class ink files in here. Uh, but I prefer to do them over in the global embed where they're going to end up eventually anyway, but but you could do that. You could have, I uh, come in here, you could say my class.inc and add it here. But my preference is to, uh, is to not put it here. But that's all that's, uh, well actually, sorry, there is one additional step. And then finally, you need to go to, this is the, the problem we've always got in Clarion, is we have to go through and tell it, uh, yes, I really do want a DLL for the output type. Uh, and then finally, for build events, you want it to run Clarion test for you, just to, to simplify uh, the whole streamlined aspect of that. Uh, I don't have that. Normally, the command is going to be Clarion test um, is, is an exe. We could say that or not. Uh, you could say unit tests two dot DLL, which is the name of this DLL. And then finally, uh, you would say slash run. And this is optional. When you uh, when Clarion test first runs, do you want it to not only load this DLL but automatically run all the tests? Usually, I would say yes. Uh, occasionally, I might uh, I might not have this in here. So that's the way that gets run there. Let's now close this app, and we'll go over and look at the other one. And we'll go back to here, and then let's just show you what that looks like in this end here. So here's build events, and here we go. In this case, I've got Clarion test sitting right in the same folder. So I just went to the trouble of saying, yes, here's where it is. I could probably, if, I wonder what happened if I just skip that. Probably works just as well. But the same idea. And you'll notice in here, in global extensions, there's that Clarion test, global include, without the DCL library, with no ink files there. And where I put them instead is in the global embeds after global includes. And there's that one piece that I wanted to do. You'll notice for naming conventions, even though this is just a little quickie thing, I still try to think of naming conventions for things. So this is MTD3 for Mini, T, Mini Tower Defense 3. And this is the grid class that I'm caring mostly about. So when I started out, I thought, well, you know what, I, I, the grids have cells, and I actually created a, uh, a cell class to start out with. Uh, and of course, when I did that, I automatically used uh, the Clarion Live class creator to do that, and, uh, and which is quite a handy tool for, for doing the pieces. And I ended up realizing that uh, for what I was doing, it, it was going to not only be much slower if I had a queue of cells being managed, a queue of cell objects. Um, it really was a simple enough problem. I ended up taking that class out eventually, but I still used this uh, for maintaining all of the definitions of things. So when I wanted to, dis uh, to, to think about this, I had to have, uh, what could I have in a cell? Well, a cell could be empty, or it could be a path cell, or it could be housing a gun or a missile, or a laser, or it could have a booster in it. And I decided that my cells would be uh, string characters. And the reason I did that was so that when I wanted to display them on the screen, they would display something useful. Uh, I didn't want to go so crazy as to try and put icons on the screen that looked the same as the original icons. I figured this is sufficient just to do this, although I do end up uh, using a similar color scheme. Um, then I had to calculate and figure out how to calculate the damage done. 
Well, it just so happens that I mentioned earlier, a gun does five damage uh, and it recharges every 0.3 time units compared to the missile doing eight damage and it recharges every 50, uh, 1.5 time units. And then a laser does 25 damage and it recharges every five time units. What is this 15 thing here? And why am I doing multiplication and this and that? Well, if you think of it, um, what I really care about is if I had all three of these guys shooting at the same spot at the same time, I want to be able to compare uh, what kind of ultimate damage they're doing over a period of time. Uh, it's not enough just to say this guy does five because it, it doesn't look like very much compared to 25, but if he can do that every 0.3 time units, every 0.3 seconds, for example, then that's potentially much better, and as you can see it is, than doing 25 every uh, every five time units. Ultimately, it means that the uh, this little gun is about actually more than five times as strong if we're talking about shooting an adjacent square. The issue comes in, of course, because uh, the gun uh, can only shoot adjacent squares, whereas the laser has much wider range. So the laser has more chance to hit that thing multiple times because it just has such a huge range that it can hit it when it's coming toward it, and then when it gets very close to it, and then again when it's going away from it, even though there's a bit of time there. There's also this additional issue of missiles, which I did not mention earlier. Missiles can hit multiple uh, enemies at, with one shot, so it may only do eight damage if it was hitting a single entity, or, but that eight damage is done to everybody who is in the range of where that particular missile lands. So you could, if you had three enemies all packed into one spot, you could potentially do 24 damage, which is almost as good as the laser. Uh, but sometimes when you've got these various levels as they send out enemies towards you, sometimes the enemies are very tightly packed and missiles are very uh, efficient ways of, of attacking uh, entities. But uh, a lot of times the levels are uh, spread out so that the enemies come few and far between. And in that situation, really the missile is a very, very weak tool. And so I, th this actual number that I came up with, even though the, the individual effect is 80, uh, I experimented with the values from 80 right on up to 240 uh, to see if I could find some happy number that, that seemed to have uh, the best impact overall when playing the level. If you put it at 240, it would never ass assign any lasers because it would say, well, there's no point in ever having lasers. And what I would discover is by only using missiles and guns, in fact, that some of them, I think if you had 240, it would just never give you anything but a missile. Of course, that's not the best way to play the game and you would end up losing the level. So I said, okay, obviously 240 was too much, 80 was too little. So I just played with the numbers. Currently, I'm at 220. I've not yet uh, done, uh, this thing to the point where it's doing as well on each of the levels as I'd like it to do. Uh, so I may keep tweaking that number further as time goes on, but that is the current value in terms of estimating the, uh, the amount of damage. So these numbers really represent the damage that each thing does over time when it considers both those things together, uh, which is better than having separate values for, for damage per shot and damage on time. I was able to put those two together to say over a span of averaging 15 time units, which was a nice common um, common multiple, uh, shared multiple, I was able to then divide that through and figure out uh, the ultimate damage over that period of time. The weapon cost was quite simple. All the weapons cost 50. Uh, the boosters were a little bit more complicated. They didn't want you to just go crazy with boosters. So the first booster you buy is worth 100. But then every time you buy a booster, the cost increases by 10. So you can't just uh, get cheap boosters forever and ever. Uh, so you used to have to start thinking about what is the logical way of me placing each of these weapons so that as they are getting boosted, they get, uh, these boosters get more and more expensive and, uh, and you have to just figure out that right balance of the, of the overall play level. So let's take a look at a couple of the tests that I wrote initially. Uh, the initial thing was just scoring. Uh, I said I wanted to have a one by one uh, space with a gun. And I just wanted to figure out what is the, what am I doing here? Oh, okay, so at this point, I think I'm just, da, 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 yes. Uh, so in this case, I have a one by one square. 
which of course means you have a space for a weapon and nothing else. So I create a grid here. Uh, and my grid is very simple, one by one grid. I set that one cell on the grid to be a gun. And of course, because there's no path for me to shoot at, I can't possibly have any damage. Because part of what it does is it, it figures out, um, I wonder, is it, I thought I had more things. Oh, I do have more. Let's, uh, I was thinking I was jumping a little too soon here. Um, for clarion test, when I'm first creating my test, the very first test I would create uh, is just one that says clarion test to make sure that everything compiles in properly. Uh, and my clarion test thing just comes in and says true equals true, just to prove that clarion test is running correctly. Uh, and you'll notice there are two different procedure types. You can have a group procedure and a test procedure. And I generally like to have my group procedures uh, every single test procedure I like to have in a group procedure, otherwise they just get scattered in the clarion test results as uncategorized. Uh, I prefer having it a little bit, little bit more organized than that. So the very first thing is this, and for numbering scheme, I number my stuff in, in batches. So the first batch of miscellaneous things is always 000 miscellaneous, and then I just have 001, 002. Uh, it's just the naming convention that I prefer. It just keeps things a little bit better organized again. Uh, the first thing I had were some basic grid tests uh, before I did anything else. I just wanted to say, what is a cell? Initially, I was testing the cell class, but then, as I say, I changed that and decided a cell was just going to be a one-character string. So a cell is one-character string, and I just assert that cell, which is currently blank, and an asterisk, this is something about Clarion test. It doesn't like just comparing strings to strings. So whenever you're comparing two strings in, in Clarion test, a lot of times you have to, uh, if, if it's going to be a blank string, if it's not a blank string, you're fine. But if it's a blank string, which in this case cell is, uh, you have to append something to it. So I just stick an asterisk on top of each piece. So the first thing I did is if, if the cell hasn't got anything in it, I just want to make sure that empty is empty. And that did prove it. I then wanted to go in and, and test the grid of cells. So here was the grid class. <clears throat> I wanted a grid to be two rows by three columns. And then I wanted to uh, make sure that after I called the init method that the number of rows in the grid was really two. And the number of columns in the grid was really three after the initialization. And then I wanted to get the first cell. And again, I expect it to be empty, which is uh, based upon our little things back here. If I had put an E for empty, that would have been fine, or a dot or something, anything other than the space. But because I'm doing a space there and comparing a space to a space, I need to make sure I append that little asterisk in there. Just a, a minor issue with clarion test. And then finally, I'm going to try setting that same point, one comma one, the top left-hand corner to a gun. And then again, I'm gonna check it and this isn't really necessary here. So we'll pull this out. So this very simple, and you'll notice unit tests do tend to be this. They test something very small, just incremental little pieces of, of, uh, of stuff to do like that. And then to the final test on my grid, and the way I wanted to be able to specify what my grid was going to look like is I wanted to be able to just create a little string, strings in a group like this to define what a grip, what a grid was going to look like. So in this case, it's kind of an S shape. Uh, and I can put plus signs to say I want there to be a path here. And, uh, and a space, of course, means it's empty and will be used or can be used for weapons. Uh, I created a couple of equates. I'm going to have nine rows. I'm going to have five columns in this particular case. Um, now, you'll notice I'm doing a cute little trick that the Clarion can do here. I have a group, and within this group, I have a bunch of cells that do not have labels. And that doesn't matter because I'm never going to try and access these particular, like, I'm never going to access this thing as a string all by itself. All I really care about is the group itself. And in reality, I don't even care so much about the group uh, if I want to access all the individual piece because I can say I want to have access each individual cell. Each cell is going to be a string of columns length. So just like this is a string of columns length right there. And how many of those? I'm going to have a dimensioned array of those strings, rows, with rows elements, uh, which is here's rows one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, uh, nine elements there. 
and then finally I say it's over cells. So what happens as a result is this variable definition is just overlapping this variable definition. And then I just have a couple of variables so I can go through and test things. So what I did here is I initialized my grid and you'll notice this is different than the other one. The last time I initialized the grid I just had the rows and columns, but this one has a third parameter of cells that basically says, I want you to initialize yourself to be a certain size, and oh, by the way, here's what you're gonna have in yourself. Uh, so I had this new method that had to be able to handle this, and then I, this is my testing of it, and I say, okay, for every single row and every single column, um, if there is a path uh, at that particular row and column, then I wanna make sure that that path element is, and because this thing actually has a non-blank value, I can get rid of that as well. I tend to be consistent with just all of my strings after a while, I just start putting stars on them, but it is superfluous. Um, so I make sure that that particular cell is a path cell. If there is no value in that particular point, I wanna make sure that that entry is an empty cell, that row and column is empty. So there are my tests, and I've also got this cute little grid.show, which I started going through after a while, so I thought, I want to be able to see this thing. So I started adding that in place, and, and we'll see how that works in a second here. In fact, if you want, we can see it right now. So I'm just going to da, 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 turn off the automatic running. And it was, so here's the cell one here, so run selected. Here was when we initialized the grid to be uh, just, I think it was three by two. And then finally I'm initializing it with a path. And there's the path. And you'll see that it's now smart enough to do this. In a little bit here, we'll take a look at how it actually displays that from that grid information, because of course it's a variable number of, of entries here. Let's take a look at the class itself and see how it does some of these things. Let's first of all go into, here's our grid class. How does the grid know what it's doing? Well, it much like, this probably looks familiar, a string of a certain number of columns and a row uh, dimension with a certain number of rows. Uh, and in this case, I said, I don't think the game's ever gonna go to 20. It turns out the maximum number of columns is nine, the maximum number of rows is 11. But I just guesstimated and said, well, I'm never gonna have more than 20 by 20. So that's my actual grid storage there. And then how many rows are in my grid and how many columns? So it's a very simple class, nothing too much as far as properties go. Uh, when it's first constructed, I wanna make sure that a couple of things are, are initialized correctly. Uh, and then here is the initialization method that we're about to take a look at. You'll notice the first two parameters are required, how many rows and how many columns, and do you have an initial grid that you want me to uh, set up? Let's go take a look at that particular entry there. So here's the init method. The first thing I do is a couple of assert statements to make sure that you haven't asked me to create more rows than I can potentially do. Uh, if I try to create suddenly something with 30 rows, my maximum is 20. So I just uh, make sure that all those parameters are reasonable. Uh, I store the value that was specified, how many rows and how many columns are they gonna be? And then if my number of cells were omitted, then I'm going to set and here's a nice little method. I have a set method, which we'll look at in a second. And uh, we'll say set the entire thing to the empty character. I want all empty characters. How much? Well, however many rows and columns this thing is supposed to be. So I'm essentially creating a big empty group that I can pass into it. Because when you pass in a group, it's the same thing as passing in a string. Uh, so I'm just creating an, a, a bunch of uh, characters in this string to say, please just set it all to empty characters. Curiously enough, uh, that is because empty is actually a space, 
I don't even really need to do that. I could have just said clear my uh, my entire array and be done with it. But if at some point in the time in the future I decide, you know what, I don't like empty being a space. I want empty to be a dot uh, or some kind of character which is an invisible character. Then suddenly all of my code would break if I assumed that the uh, that this would just be cleared. So I said, you know what, let's just assign it to be that particular character. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to call the set method and I'm going to pass in the actual string that was passed into this method. So let's take a look at get and set because they're kind of interesting. Now, <laughs> this is a cute little thing. Uh, actually, you know what, let's take a look at set first. It's simpler. And then I'll take a look at get. So here's set. You pass in a string with all the cells. It's got to be able to count through those to set them. Uh, again, I make sure that somebody actually did specify, um, or is this, that somebody has initialized this grid. I don't want somebody setting me if I don't know how many rows and columns I'm supposed to have. So I make sure, first of all, that I have a valid, valid value there. And then for every row, for every column, set the cell at that row and that column two and here's a little bit of fancy math to get this stuff whatever row we're on minus one so the first row will be zero time the number of columns in each row and then add whatever the column is and that gives us an index into the string that's passed so that we can always convert rows and columns into this linear string which is just a one-dimensional string and not a two-dimensional array so that's where this magical math happens uh, and so that's the setting operation. Getting is similar. Um, getting, uh, the, the difference here is for some bizarre reason, I decided to be fancy with this. I, I was having too much fun. I created a mini version of string theory here. Uh, so uh, what I had is I have a little class called string, str. Uh, it has a reference to a string inside. It has a constructor uh, where you can pass in a grid here and uh, and uh, you'll ex I'll explain here in a second why we need to do this uh, and it's called construct underscore notice and then a destructor and then I have a row and column counter just like I did with that other method the first thing I do is I construct this string with uh, passing in a copy of myself you go well, what the world are you doing why are you doing that uh, well I wanted to be able to have this thing uh, this little mini class uh, allocate a string that was going to be big enough to hold the value that I was going to return. Uh, and I could have just said, you know what, let's just create a string which is equal to the, the maximum number of rows times the maximum number of columns. Yeah, sure, that would have worked, but this was more fun. And we are talking about playing, aren't we? So I created this little thing where I said, okay, uh, I want to create a new string. And originally I just said self.rows and self.columns, but that didn't work because even though I am within this class's method, I should be able to say self.rows, self.columns. The problem is I'm defining another class within that. So self didn't mean the grid class, self meant the string class. So I needed some way to get that stuff in there. So I said, well, let's just pass it in as a parameter. So now I can say the grids, rows, and columns have to be set. Uh, and then finally, give me a string that's that big. Well, that's a little bit overkill, but again, we're having fun. And finally, when this thing goes out of scope, I have to make sure that it disposes of that string. So this is just me playing around. Da, da, da. So what I do at the start is I construct it. And then I say for all the rows and columns, the strings row minus one times the columns plus column there we go uh, that fancy bit of math again is equal to and then we're calling a method to get the row and column uh, the actual cells value so we do have something to help us out a little bit here uh, while we're at it let's take a look at that get cell uh, just take a look at some of the methods here so we have here here's get cell passing in a row and a column and what does it do well it's doing a different kind of trick here it's saying that because it knows self.cell is a dimensioned variable, let's go back to where it's defined here so you can see what this is. Let me just copy this over. So that's what cell looks like. It looks like a string of a certain number of characters dimensioned as a certain number of rows. So because I know that self.cell is that thing, I say, okay, I want the roweth 
row and I'm using string splicing so <laughs> it looks like it's two arrays and it really is but what's really happening is this first one is the array element of this dimension and the second piece is a string slice of one character of this string and I suspect the compiler probably would have let me do that as well but because it was um, a dimensioned array and then a string slice I decided I want to put them separately like that and in reality I probably could have done something similar string slicing up here well actually I did use string slicing here the problem is I needed to do the calculation of where is the row and column uh, I don't know what would have happened if I had done well it probably wouldn't have worked otherwise no I definitely needed to have it broken up as rows uh, does it down one thing might have been interesting to try would be trying to do something like this yeah we'll try that a little later just going to put in some code here just to try and do this I'm going to comment that out for the moment copy that comment that I'm oh, sorry keep that comment this but this is going to be cell oh that's what I also needed to, we want this to be over cells this is similar to what we did before we've got one string coming in the issue though is it has to be self dot rows I don't know if this would allow this this is the problem oh, sorry self dot columns this is the same sort of thing self dot now the reason I don't think this will work is I don't think it well it might allow that this is a runtime variable and runtime variables uh, because they're created in the stack you can often do things uh, that would uh, not necessarily make sense if this was compiled code because if it if you know the size of compile time it's going to be a problem because we don't know what self.rows and self.columns is but because this is runtime it may allow this but this particular self.calls may not do the trick let's say if I happen to be be doing this where we could say columns and um, byte calls rows and byte columns because those two variables are passed in I most definitely know that I could do it with oh, where are we here that and that that would work if we were passing in the rows and columns I'm just not sure whether the compiler would like it when it starts getting these complex dereferenced values it may not it may think that's a little too weirdo but let's just frame that in for the moment and we'll maybe come back to it later so that's how I set a single cell is I uh, or so, well, that's how I set the entire grid is I just go through and I set all those individual elements like that so get cell does that set cell does the exact same thing except that it, uh, it's assigning it back the other direction the row and the column and then again there is that fancy which dimensioned row and which slice column so let's go back and take a look at our thing here so now we come to scoring and I'm just going to temporarily take this back out of there because we don't need to show that now I want to try some scoring so I've got this one by one one by two uh, so a gun all by itself in a square we've already looked at this particular one you'll see that if I've got just got one square and it's got a gun of course no damage is going to happen because there are no path areas for it to hit well what if I increase the size of the grid by one character now we have one row and two columns we have one of those is going to be path and one of them is going to be a gun so let's see how we might define this I'm going to initialize my grid one row two columns I'm going to set the, the left hand column is going to be a path square and the right hand column is going to be a gun and now I want to assert that my score for this whole grid so it's going to go through and figure out what's the total score of the grid is this a good score for the grid well what would the score be I want to make sure that it's equal equal to five and if you recall back 
when we looked at here, uh, the amount of damage a gun can do to a single square is 250. Well, how am I checking it to see if it equals five? Where's this five come through? Well, really what I want is if I could have unlimited money, all I care about is total damage. But the problem is different amounts of, uh, different collections of weapons and boosters have a different cost. So if I could have somehow a minimum number of weapons and tons and tons of boosters, I might get a maximum damage happening, but it may cost me a huge amount because of the escalating cost of those boosters because each booster I buy costs more and more. So I had to ha come into some way of, of determining uh, the cost in the whole thing and I decided let's just make it simple. Let's just divide the total uh, uh, damage done by the cost. So we end up getting ultimately a value or an overall score, which is why when we look at the gun doing 250 to a, to a single adjacent square, but a gun costs 50, 250 divided by 50 is five. So that's how I determine the score for that particular one. If we go on to the next one, I said, let's look at a number of different weapons here. In this case, I'm going to create a grid of one row and four columns. I'm going to set the first or the, 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 the second, third, and fourth column are all going to be path cells. And then we are going to test each of our weapons. In the first cell, in that in that left hand cell, I'm going to put a gun, first of all. Well, a gun. And at this point, I started bringing in the uh, the equates into, into the tests themselves. So a gun does it can only hit one of those squares because it can only touch adjacent squares, and it's in the left hand square, so it can only get to the second square. It can't get to the third and fourth. So there's only one square it can reach. It's going to do a gun's damage, and it's going to be divided by the weapon's damage. And while we're at it, why don't we change this to uh, weapon cost just for the readability? So the damage gun can do divided by the weapon cost. We want to make sure that that equals the right number. Now we know that a, a, a missile can reach two. And this is actually a magic number. I don't have an equate for this yet. I think it's, it's all hard coded at the moment, which is a bad thing for me, which is why you'll notice I keep coming through and fixing them as we are looking at it here. So if, because a missile can reach two squares, its total damage that it can do to each square is times two elements. And then we're dividing that again because we have one weapon. So we're dividing it just by the cost of that one weapon. Why am I going at 2.0 and 1.0 here? Uh, the reason for that is I wasn't certain that this was going to happen, but it just so happens that uh, gun is a integer value. The cost is an integer value. and I've occasionally been tricked out where if all of the variables were integers, sometimes Clarion just decides to do integer math until it starts recognizing that it should do something else. And the fact that I wanted to do one times here up front and this, and then it doesn't get to the division at the end, it might be okay in this case, but I've just gotten into the habit sometimes of saying, you know what, if it's all integers in my in my calculation, I want to make sure right up front that I give it something that's not an integer so that it understands that I really want you to give me a real fractional value back from this. So that's why I put 1.0, 2.0, and 3.0. If you ever find your math coming back and giving you all whole numbers when you know that there should be a fraction in there somewhere or giving you back a fraction but it's giving you a weird fraction this might be what's biting you uh, it doesn't happen often but it's happened to me often enough that i that i'm just careful about it and, and i sort of make sure that i'm explicit about saying i am dealing with floating point numbers here please just make sure you do that of course if instead of being a, an equate this was a real uh, variable or a decimal variable, it would have automatically done floating, floating point math for me. 
And of course, if all of the variables were floating point numbers or decimals, it would have automatically done uh, BCD math on it rather than doing floating point math. <coughs> Uh, so similar to the, to, to the missiles, I'm uh, saying it can reach three. Uh, the damage it does divided by the weapon cost. So I just wanted to make sure that all the weapons are calculating the proper value. And then finally, I did this one sort of a big nine by nine grid because um, I wanted to ensure that the concept of the range of each weapon was correct. So I said, I'm going to do a grid of nine by nine. And in this case, instead of uh, defining it as a, as a string and passing it in, I decided, let's just go through all the rows and columns. I'm not sure why, why you did an R and I, uh, whatever. I must have added this at some point and said, hold on, I need to initialize this and decided not to create variables. It seems a little silly. Uh, let's fix that. I, even in the unit test, I don't like seeing that row. Byte, column, byte. Um, row, column, row, column, there. Uh, da -da -da. So I just went through and made sure every single piece in it was a path. And that means that it really isn't entirely a path, but it says, but you know what? The, the cell at the very, very center, halfway down, halfway across, I'm gonna make it into a gun. And I want to make sure that the score is going to be equal to, and you're saying, well, what's this eight number here? Well, eight happens to be, if you count all the adjacent squares around this gun, happens to be eight. So eight squares times the gun's damage divided by the fact that there is one of these guns. Uh, similarly, because the missile can reach two squares, if you count all the squares that are two away uh, from the missile, that happens to be 24 squares. I could have done this if I wanted to. Three times three times three minus one it gives you the same number. Except I need that in parentheses now. Three times three minus one. I could have done this as four times four minus one. Oops. There, make sure again that it's doing. I'm pretty sure it would be fine. Well, you know what? Let's take it out and see what happens. Ha <laughs> ha. Live dangerously. Five times five minus one. Is that right? No, sorry. Four. Three. Three. Not three, four, five. Five times five minus one. And seven times seven. Um, and then again, we need the weapon cost. Fix these as we go. And if we wanted to be really explicit, we could have done this. We could have said to the power of two, 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 because that's really what it is. And for fun, let's see how this looks. Show each of those. So that was weapon in the middle of all paths. So we can run selected. There's a gun. There's a missile. There's our laser. Now, you'll notice that it doesn't really show any kind of animation because that's not the point. This was just to visualize how the thing was going to look. And of course, once we get the entire board built out, it's going to show me where to put everything so that then I can uh, decide how am I going to uh, play out the game. Because this doesn't play the game for me. This simply says, here is a strategy that you might want to uh, apply. Uh, it's still up to me to decide how to actually uh, use that information. It's just a cheat sheet, essentially. So now we have to come into the concept of maximizing. You'll notice the first uh, the first set of things are just, can we work with the grid? Very basic concept, functionally setting it up. Do Once we have the grid working, we can place weapons in the grid. Do we do the scoring in terms of the weapons on the grid? And then finally, let's, uh, let's go ahead and, and uh, try and do some maximization options here to find the best 
layout we can. So the first layout we had was uh, one by four with an empty path. And I think, uh, I'm not sure I did one by four empty path. One, two, three. Okay, so what we're doing is we've got a one by four, and, one, and then we've got three path characters, two, three, and four, but no weapon in that first cell in one comma one. Um, we're not using, uh, we want to optimize it to say what score are you going to get. Uh, we want to get cell. Oh, did I, did I actually put a gun on here? I don't see myself putting a gun on. Weird. It's uh, interesting. I wonder how this would actually work. It must be missing a line somewhere. We've got to check and make sure this thing works. So we're calculating the scores equal to five. Well, that makes no sense. We got let's let's test this. This doesn't make any sense. There needs to be a gun somewhere being set. Let's test this uh, this little thing here. Let's go in and do this. I want to see what the grid, and let's turn off the grid, oh well, yeah. And it was this. Oh, there is a gun. How did we get the gun in there? Am I just overlooking the line? Well, how are we getting the gun in there? Set cell, set cell. Here's my path. Where's the gun coming from? I have no idea. Isn't that odd? Let's just put another unit test here. Let's go assert that. There, I get cell one comma one is equal to empty. Are we sure this is the same one? It is named the same. Well, how is this even, this is really odd. Let's just create something here. If I got this code in the right place, yes I do. Let's just assert that true is equal false. Fail. So that definitely caused it to fail. So how in the world is it getting, uh, how in the world is it possibly getting a gun in there? That's really interesting. Let's just double check here. So it says it's empty, empty one. Oh, that's why, sorry. I'm a just ignore me. I'm a complete ninny. Um, <laughs> uh, I forgot what the optimize method did. <laughs> what the optimize method did is it says, go and find what you think is the best weapon for each of these squares. So what it does is it optimizes it. And it says, well, I've looked at all the squares and I would say the best thing to put in this one square with two path areas is a gun. And the reason for that is that even though the gun is the, the, has a very short range, it does 250 damage to that one cell. That next one, the missile will do 120 damage to two cells, but that's still only 240. Uh, this thing can access all three, but it's only doing uh, 225. So the gun still wins. Now, if I happen to increase this to 130, and we ran the same test, and 
and optimizing that. You'll see now it's put a missile there. It expected a gun and it got a missile. So that definitely is a fail. So you'll see that it actually is smart enough to be calculating the, uh, the proper values there. So let's put this back to 120 again. And this is what I was indicating is if we keep increasing the strength of the missiles, eventually it won't put anything else anywhere. It'll just say missiles are all we're gonna have. But the problem is missiles don't shoot fast enough to get to some of the quicker moving, uh, quicker moving enemies. So you have to at some point have at least some number of guns and or lasers. Uh, and uh, like I say, I've not finished experimenting with it to see uh, the impact in an actual, in actual gameplay, uh, but, uh, but there we are. And again, because these are not empty strings, even though I get into a habit of adding these bits, we can take those out now. And let's just make sure that we didn't break our unit test here. We can go back to being passed. And it passed. Just get rid of showing that thing. So that was a very simple uh, thing. In this case, let's create a two by two grid. And there's gonna be two paths and one gun. So this is being built up using this new method. So I'm gonna specify this. So I have two path areas. So I initialize my grid with the number of rows and columns that I've got and initialize it with my group. And then I'm saying on the second row in the first column, I'm going to put a gun. I expect this gun to do a certain amount of damage. I expect it to do 500 damage. Now I'm not actually doing optimization here. I'm just doing damage calculation. In the other case, I was, uh, uh, is that my spot? Yeah, so in this case, I just went to, instead of optimizing, I'm just calling the damage directly to make sure the damage was fine. So I must have, at this point in time, I must have gotten an unexpected result. So I went back and wrote another unit test just to verify that it was doing the calculation properly. Because even though this is in the optimization group, this was something that was uh, other than optimization. So really what I should do is rename this one and put it back into, well, it's not even scoring, it's really into damage. So I could create another group for that if I wanted to. But um, that's fine. So here we're creating a ring path with a gun in the middle, which was quite similar to what we did back in this point. And then I'm doing a scoring of that. And you'll see that I go through with just a variety of different pieces. I do a three by three ringing around a gun. I do five by five around a gun. It's nine by a nine by five. I should probably nine by nine is my guess. Yes, it should be nine by nine. And then I started going through and, and working with actual game levels. Uh, so in this particular case, the first level of the game is this little S shape. And I initialized it with that thing. I told it to do an optimization without boosters. I just wanted to see where it would put everything. And then I wrote a bunch of, uh, at one point I had a bunch of unit tests that I wanted to assert were, uh, were a certain thing coming in place. I'm not sure why. I disabled it at some point, I think, because it was showing me too much information. I probably could have just done this. Oh, I don't want to stop here, of course. Yeah, I was obviously debugging something, so I had a bunch of stop statements. I could still have that and just not, uh, and just not show it. I was just trying to prevent it from wasting my time with displaying things. Uh, but that's again going to be nine by nine. Oh, sorry, no, nine by five is correct for level five. And then when I started going to the higher levels at this point, so what I'm working on at this point, for example, is level 81. So level 81 is a little bit more circuitous. Circuitous, you can see that it starts at the top, it goes down and across and up and across and down and across and up and across and down. You have all these different places to be able to put things. So I said, well, here we get 11 rows, nine columns, bang. Um, and then I needed to run some tests. So I have my local variables for that. Uh, again, I did something similar with that.
And let's go ahead and show this here. So we will, uh, which one is this? This is level 81. Eighty one bang. So here we go. Down oh sorry, down and up and across and down and across and up and across and down all over the place. And it says, Oh, you know what? Look at this. Here we have this nice little cross point. So let's put a gun here and a gun here because it's it's really tight to the corner. So he gets to touch one, two, three, four, five. Oh gosh, that's an efficient way of doing that. And then this guy does the same kind of maneuver. Uh, here are some missiles here because it says, well, I can reach that guy, that guy, and all the way down to there. So that guy's able to reach a fairly wide range. So it says, you know what, a missile to start makes a lot of sense like that. Then we get into various areas like this laser can reach all the way up to here and all the way down to here. So it makes a lot of sense that there's a whole bunch of lasers along the strip because they can reach all these lines that are going crisscrossing this, this playing field like this. So what the system has done is, is it's gone through and you're saying, gosh, that sure happened fast. How in the world did it do all of that? What it actually does is it just looks at each square and it tries to say for each square, let's go through and look at all the different possible weapons we could put there and which weapon would have the maximum damage at that point. So it, it's doing actually a very simple bit of processing here. It's just doing this array once and it's saying for at each one, let's just do a calculation for each of these points. And it's saying there, we're done. That those are the most optimal positions to fill every blank space with the best weapon for that particular space so that it, it has the most far reaching impact on the most path cells. Then the next step that it does, you'll notice when I when I call the optimize function, I had a I had a parameter I could pass in to say, do you want boosters? It assumes that you do want to have boosters. So what it does is after it says I've now optimally placed all of these uh, weapons at each square to say, are you getting the best score possible at this particular spot? It says, okay, now I can look at the total damage that my entire board does. All of the weapons in all of the squares, let's add them all up, and then let's divide them by the total cost of all of these weapons in the board. Of course, each weapon costs 50, so that's fairly simple. But then we say, okay, that is our base score. Let's say, let, let, let's say that's sort of the best we can do without any boosters. But then let's start going through in every single square, I wanna try putting a booster there instead. And at every square, I'll replace the weapon with a booster and see what is the new score. Because of course, if we put a booster at this position, suddenly this weapon's doing twice as much and that one's doing twice as much and that one's doing twice as much and that one's doing, you know, everything around that booster, everything adjacent is gonna get powered up and do twice as much damage. And then if you put two boosters here, well, this particular entry, because it's adjacent to that booster, is gonna be twice as much, and now because of this one, it's three times as much, and because it's there, it's now four times as much as it would typically do if it was all by itself. Of course, the boosters have a cost. The first one is 100, the second was 110, the third was 120. So at each point, as is adding these boosters, it says, okay, I'm gonna try and place a booster and find one so that my total score of my optimized board, which is the total damage divided by the total cost, is my total score higher than it was before? And if it was, great, that's a good place to put a booster. And it actually looks for all of those possibilities and says, which booster is the first one to put for the best optimization, which is why this one's the first booster that should be placed. And then it says, okay, good. Now that I know that's gonna be a booster, let's look at all these other ones. And it just ha so happens that putting another booster right beside it is actually the most beneficial thing, which is interesting because this booster can only boost weapons. It doesn't boost boosters. So if I had a weapon here instead, this guy would be boosting that one. But it said, you know what? Even if you lose this weapon, it's boosting these other guys. And these other guys are reaching enough other squares on the board that it's worthwhile giving up one of these weapons so you can boost the, the surrounding entries even further, even though there's another booster right adjacent and again adjacent here. Uh, this, so it's rather when you see patterns like this. So this is ultimately how I came to the, to, to the solution of, of doing this and not having it take forever. It's essentially saying, let's just create, cre treat it like a much simpler problem. What's the most powerful 
weapon, the most impactful weapon you can have at each cell. And then once you've decided the base board play for every cell having the best weapon for that cell, where can we optimally place boosters so that our overall benefit is uh, is increased? And the interesting thing is I actually tell it, keep putting boosters until the boosters don't help anymore. So if it had been made sense for me to put 100 boosters on here, it would have kept going. But it actually maxed out at eight. It said, if I put another booster anywhere on this board, yes, it'll boost the surrounding things at that particular point, but it's going to cost so much more at that point that you're ultimately not benefiting from it. Now, the one thing I've not done, uh, I've watched a couple of people on, they've got a couple of these levels where they're playing it on YouTube and they're, they're solving levels with, interestingly enough, many squares empty. And what they decided to do is instead of filling every single square with a weapon, they said, let's leave some of them empty so that we can not spend money on those weapons and as a result, have more money for boosters. And what they found is that, and that may make sense, that it may, may be that if the person put a booster here and then skipped three or four of these entries down here, skipped these three guys down here, then all the remainders of here would be boosted that might be a worthwhile thing to do because these guys, if you recall, they can reach all the way up to one, two, three. So this guy in the corner can hit those three entries. But he takes so long to recharge, he'd hit it once. And then by the time he recharges, the thing's gone. So there'd be very little benefit to that guy hitting it. But if I could stick another booster here and this guy can hit these ones here, he can hit these ones here, he can hit these ones here. There's a real benefit to boosting these guys. So it might be worthwhile to playing this game through at some point and not using these three or four boosters at the bottom down here just so that I can get extra impact on these three rows. Uh, additionally, there, there's, there's extra uh, logic that has to be done. Many of the levels have many, many enemies that come out at first and you want to get rid of as many of them as possible as quickly as possible and because they're clumped together it makes sense to have more missiles up at the start once they get down close to the end missiles aren't as beneficial because you really want the big lasers to be hitting them super hard so these missiles down here doesn't make any sense and you'll notice that i've not uh, i happen to know that it starts up here and ends down here but i haven't specified that in, in my game simulation here i haven't tried to uh, to simulate the concept of give missiles a higher priority if they're near the start and a lower priority if they're near the end um, just trying to to calculate is a square near the start or near the end could become quite challenging. So I don't know whether I'll go to that trouble because ultimately this is just for a game. This is just playing around. I was getting mildly irritated and thought, this is such a mathematical thing. Might I be able to make myself more intelligent and more capable at strategizing this thing with this little helper on doing some of the calculations and some of the math for me, rather than me trying to, to do it all intuitively. Uh, because I did find that I was doing various different things in gameplay um, that I thought were the right thing to do, even though I had a full understanding of this whole ranging and everything else, until I really started getting into the numbers and running some unit tests on it, I didn't realize that I was actually playing the game less efficiently than I thought I was. And now that I've got, it's brought me up to a new level of playing this uh, and also making me realize that even my simulation is somewhat, uh, somewhat in incapable of handling the real complexity of this game. It looks like it's a fairly simple concept, but there's, uh, there's actually a, a great deal of nuance going, going on. Uh, it also gives me a much better appreciation for, for things like chess games and the way they score a given, uh, a given layout on the board. And I think the early, the early chess games when they, when they were trying to simulate a chess player uh, would try to uh, score uh, a layout of a board in a, in a certain way as to the value of it. Trying to, to, to determine the strategy in chess is much, much, much more complicated than this. And it gives me a great appreciation for, for chess programs uh, and their ability to process that. And of course, people in general in their ability to be exceptionally good chess players. Uh, and with that, I think we've exhausted this particular topic as much as I want to talk about it today. Um, 
any questions? I haven't even looked. I've just been nattering on here for a long, long time on this particular topic. Let me check questions real quick here. There's no questions. There no questions. questions. I, I've just, I, I completely uh, uh, stunned everybody with, uh, <laughs> with this topic. I think. Um, uh, now we've got a few minutes to spare here. Uh, I, I had that one extra little thing that I'd thrown together last week. Would you like me to go on and, uh, and talk about that? Because it'll never be large enough to be a webinar unto itself, but oh, it, yeah. involves the, it involves the concept of, of um, variable size icons and how they appear in clearing programs. And I thought it was kind of a, a neat little thing. Yeah, if you don't mind, that sounds, that sounds nice. Okay, so let's this is, close this. This. Is, this is, it's like, you went through so fast. There's so many things. There's unit testing. There's classes, and there's the yeah. oh, and, and one thing I didn't even... over. So it's uh, it, it's neat, but I'll have to watch this again if I want to <laughs> really really understand. Oh yeah, yeah. And mostly it was just like a hmm. I never even considered that possibility. There's a few things you'll learn about in it, and 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 that does bring up one thing I I completely forgot to mention. This little show method that I do. Here's the window where I display things. And you'll notice that it's just nothing. Well, what's the deal here? Okay, well, this particular entry is just, it's just really a placeholder more than anything else. It's a cell sample over there. And what I did to create all, because I don't know how many grids and how many rows and columns I've got, I, I go ahead and I open the window and I, 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 I set prop pixels just because I, what I've noticed is when you do things in grids, um, when you use DLUs, every once in a while it hops over a pixel and you get a blank little strip. So that irritates me. So whenever I'm doing this kind of display, I always do it in pixels rather than rather than DLUs because then it doesn't do that that weirdness of of the math of skipping a pixel here and there and getting funny funny spots in it. Um, y is equal to four, and I'm not sure why I would have done that rather than saying. I wonder if there's an earlier version of this. That and I could have gotten this. Uh, this does look like it might have been old. Interesting. Um, let's go ridge. Oh, you know, actually, actually, I'm thinking of something else I was doing earlier this week. A completely different project, but similar kind of code. Ridge X is going to be long auto and ridge Y. Um, Let's put them down here. Uh, and I'm going to say rejects. Uh, you know what? I never do take Y. I could just sit, leave Y like that. Um, so we'll leave. We'll take this up here. There. Sure. And then this is going to say Y is, doesn't even need to be there because I'm getting it now. And this is going to be rich X. So what I do is I get the position of that sample cell and I say for each row that I have to go through with the rows, uh, let's start, make sure that I start in the first column where it's going to be. Um, and then uh, for all my columns, I'm going to use the create command. And I don't know how many people use the create command. In a, I don't use it a lot, but when I need to use it, it's really, really handy. It basically lets you create controls as if you would actually define it on your window itself. And in this case, the first parameter I've got is zero, which just says that I want to um, have, uh, excuse me, um, I don't care what field equate you give it. I just just give it whatever is next. Uh, and what do I want to create? I want to create a string, which is the exact same kind of thing I've got here, a string character. By the way, there are two different kinds of strings. There's create string and create S string. And S string is used if it was like this instead, use, oh, my bear. If you were using some local variable, so this is a variable string. It really was a display only string, but it was getting its value from a variable rather than being just a, a, a constant string. Um, then that's an S string instead of a string uh, when you're creating them, just for, for, for reference sake. And you'll notice this sample string is um, um, hidden there. Uh, so I go ahead and I say that um, my text 
uh, okay, so I create the string and I now have a field equate. So I'm saying, please set position of that thing to be the x, y, w, high, h, uh, and uh, the text is equal to whatever the cell's thing is. I don't, don't know what's going to be in the cell, but I'll put it there. I want to center it like the other cell, and I want to transparent it like the other cell. And I could have said if I wanted to, uh, I could have said uh, cell sample prop center like that. Um, and then for each um, of the, what am I doing here? Prop oh yes, so here I'm saying, depending upon what the cell type is, what the weapon is, I need to have it a different color. This is where I do my coloring. So I say for all of these possible things, it's gonna be one of these colors. So with the cell booster, if it's, if it actually set a B for booster, then I would make it yellow, but more often I tend to have these values here. Uh, and then finally, after I fiddled with the cell, with the control as much as I want, I unhide it. Any cell that you create with the create command must be unhidden if you wanna see it. So I do that and then I skip over the width, the standard width of each cell. So I've made this thing, you'll notice it's nine by nine is the width and the height. So it skips over the width, and then when it finishes the entire row, it skips over the height to go to the next row, uh, and then finally when it's done, it turns off the pixels, uh, or pixels equals false. And I just realized that that was wrong, and I actually had that as a bug in my other program as well. Uh, and I fixed that bug in the other program, but I didn't come back and fix it here. So there we go. And then finally, uh, so that is how I end up uh, displaying the values. It's a, it's kind of a neat little thing where I, I didn't have to create, because uh, the other option would have been actually creating a window structure with 20 by 20 cells on it, uh, 400 individual controls, uh, and then at runtime, hide all the ones I don't want to see and do some kind of translation between columns and rows and stuff like that. It's uh, uh, It just felt like this was a, a, a cooler way to do it. So I, I like writing writing this code every once in a while. So there you go. That was the one piece of this thing that I didn't show and had planned to show. So now you really have seen everything you need to see for the moment. Uh, da -da -da. Now, uh, and I will put this up just for, for anybody who's marginally interested. I'll put this up on, uh, on uh, I've got a GitHub uh, repo, uh, and I'll, uh, I'll let you guys pull it down from there. I've decided to start putting all of my Clarion Live stuff up there going forwards, and any old stuff, I'll, I'll get it. There's some of the old stuff up there already, but uh, uh, let's just quickly go to um, this one here, and if we go to GitHub, uh, good, I'm logged in, and we have, so here's the, here's the repo here. It's github.com slash box slash webinar. Could have done Clarion Live, I guess, but I happen to call the folder webinar on my uh, on my folder. So uh, so if you want to grab things in the future, this is where you can go to get everything that I'm doing in all the Clarion Live webinars. And with that, let's jump back here and let's close this and let's close this. And then let's open up, uh, where is it here? Icon, okay. So here is our example. So I have this, this is a window I created way back when. And a lot of you have seen this. I probably mentioned it in webinars before. I certainly mentioned it during one of our uh, CIDCs. And I really like the fact that Clarion's buttons uh, will, uh, da, 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 where are we here? Oh, this is why. This is a really big window. Uh, the Clarion's icons can be multi-different sizes. Let's open up, uh, where is XELS Icon Worship, Workshop Worship. Let me grab myself some water. So let's go ahead and open up recent, that one. So this is the icon that we've got in my little test here. I'm just gonna, Come on. Oh, it won't let me push, that's odd. Why won't it let me go? 
So here's this icon, and you'll notice I got a bunch of different sizes of this. Hold on a second, I'm pouring some water here. I need to concentrate while I do this so I don't pour water all over my keyboard. <laughs> It used to be that we cared a lot about creating different uh, color densities, palettes uh, of our icons uh, because we were concerned that uh, we needed Windows machines that had only 16 colors because of the graphics card, but we don't really care about that anymore. Uh, so when I create icons, I just create all of them with just RGBA. Um, and, but you do want to create a whole bunch of different resolutions because depending upon where it's displaying things, uh, Windows likes to use a different size and Clarion also likes to use a different size. So here I've got 256 and 128 and 64 and 48 all the way down to, and then once I hit 32, look what, I, with not all my icons I do this, but notice that I'm, I've got every two right down to well, we could even go further down if we wanted to. Let's try going to, um, let's create another icon. Uh, where is it here? No, it's not it. Uh, insert, what I want. Uh, let's create another icon. Let's go custom size and let's go down to 14 by 14. And let's create another icon and let's do a custom size and let's go 12 by 12. And let's create another icon and let's do another custom. We'll do 10 by 10. And one more custom size, 8 by 8. So, what happens in Clarion is they just say, How big is the thing that I'm displaying? And how big is the thing that's going to fit? And, and I started getting frustrated because I would create buttons and I was never quite sure exactly how it was going to display. So, I just went crazy one day and said, Let's just create a whole bunch of buttons on here um, so that I can see for uh, you know these normal kind of buttons where it's just a normal left justified button with an icon of a different heights. How is it going to show itself up? This is probably 256 height is 135 yeah um, but if we made it bigger I think if we increase the size of this thing to uh, let's just take it up to 200 oh no I guess this, it must already be dis displaying the uh, the 255 pixel one uh, 135 let's go to 250 nope 135 so I just went through with the various different heights to try and figure out where does the size change and how is the text displaying and how much space do I have. And you'll notice for things like toolbar buttons, uh, depending upon whether it's flat or not flat, you can see a little like this is they're both these are both 24 by 24, but this guy the 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 text is pretty much all overlapped, and this guy you can see a little bit of it. So if you've got flat buttons, they display a little bit differently than uh, than that. And in reality, this is in the um, the, the, the designer, but if we go through and preview this window, it's a little bit more accurate because it's how it'll actually look in the program. And you go, hey, hold on, look at that. It doesn't matter whether it's flat or not, so you better always preview it and make sure that you're really looking at what you're looking at. So you see how Clarion deals with these different sizes and how much, how you might want to make your toolbar buttons if you want two lines of text. Maybe you need to go 24 by 44 so you can get two lines in there. Uh, and just just gives you a sense as to as to how do you play with it uh, and how these different things appear. And I've I've done this not only with buttons, uh, but uh, I've got a few programs where I have played with it because it'll do this on list boxes as well. I'm just going to run a program real quick here. I uh, can't do it there. Let's just run. Um, uh, where is that thing? Uh, no, oh, I think it's called something. There we go. Oop. Um. Oh, well, there's a directory called Sims. There we go, that's what I want. So here we have this lovely program and we've got 
our little toolbar buttons up here and we have these beautiful icons in this program so many nice icons this icon you'll notice is the same as that icon but because it's in a different size button it automatically uses a different different size of icon i didn't have to worry about sort of creating two different icons with different names and have to remember them and then worry about oh gosh i changed the screen structure changed the font size now to go back and fix it i just like clearing and deal with it for me um if we go into our classes here you'll notice that these list line heights are really quite high and it's able because it just kind of made sense of the number of entries there to to make them a little bit higher uh, and i guess these beautiful little icons so they can quickly see what it is without having to read every single one of them this one is a little bit smaller again so it just automatically used the right size over here we've got icons showing up in those different sizes like that so depending upon the circumstances, I would use different list line heights and it automatically uses the right size of icon. Uh, da, 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 here, no icons there. Uh, here, I use some really big ones here again. But this is not the same size as that or that. So it just automatically says, hey, if you want it to be this tall, it just deals with it for you. Uh, clearing does a quite quite a nice job like that a, a lot of people get concerned about trying to get their icons to showing up in weird places in weird sizes uh, I think part of that is because so many of us just had 16 by 16 on a 32 by 32 grid for our icons on list boxes we just got used to having those icons with, and when we were afraid of ever varying off of that but if you just make sure that all of your icons are set up with all of these different sizes. Um, as you start using them in, in these kinds of situations, uh, you'll see the clearing does a fantastic job of automatically sizing that for you. Uh, and what I did is because my little example program over here, uh, am I still running that program in the background? No, I'm not. Uh, uh, I wanted to be able to do the same thing, but for lists as well. So what I did here is da, 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 uh, run it. So if I hit any of these buttons, I get a list box. And here's my list box, and I think it's currently nine units. And if I go bigger, you'll notice that every once in a while, it keeps giving me. Sometimes it gives me a bigger size, like you'll notice with each of these ones as I went through here. It kept giving me bigger and bigger sizes because I had all those different sizes at each two pixel limit so if you're planning on using icons for your list boxes and you like varying up your line height a little bit like this uh, I would or changing fonts from screen to screen this kind of thing for those smaller sizes try and have as many different sizes as you can uh, and there's a, there are quite a few benefits to, to, to doing that but as far as the tools I use Axialis icon workshop and it's also got another tool now called uh, uh, icon generator because all of their icons now they actually release initially as vector icons uh, and then those work very well for scaling to different sizes if you take a 256 by 256 icon and scale it down usually it's a pretty good image but if you have a vector based icon uh, from icon work uh, from axialis uh, it you'll notice scales much better to all these different funny little sizes like this that seems to be much uh, much more capable of understanding that concept and how to add the alias all the different edges um, but as we're going up, you'll notice the size changes for each one. But every once in a while, it says, okay, now I've hit, like here, it's not changed the size there. Eventually, I'll get to a spot where it goes, oh, okay, oh, now I've got enough space. Let's get the next size up. And the fact that it actually moves the text over for you as well. Uh, I did a, uh, tried to determine one time what the logic was for this. And I think the closest I came up with is, Whatever your line height is times 1.45 is the width that it, that it uh, ends up bumping this over. So uh, if you need to make sure that your column is, is, is wide enough that it's going to fit this icon, you can't just assume that my column width is, is going to be uh, uh, 9 DLUs to fit an icon. Because if, you're, if your line height is 10, then you really need 14 and a half or 14 DLUs because I think I just multiply 1.45 and then I truncate it. Uh, I just do an int on it at that point, but but that seems to be the magical number is 1.45. So, uh, and as we go bigger and bigger, you'll notice it keeps giving us bigger 
icons of, until we eventually hit this 255 by 255, which is the same as we have over here on the right-hand side. Uh, so this is kind of a handy little tool to just help you visualize uh, how big those icons are going to display and the flexibility of them. Uh, and because I know this works really, really well as a concept within Clarion, I really have fun with varying up my line sizes uh, because many times we'll give people a browse which it has maybe four lines. It's only ever going to have four lines on the screen. It's like my, my little program back here. Um, you know, when I'm, when I'm dealing with seasons, if I had this still is the, the standard 10 DLUs or 11, what most people, I think 10 is a pretty common thing that people tend to do, or the default, which I think for Clarion is eight or nine, uh, which is stupidly skinny. Uh, you'd see so many of these semesters down here, it would just fill the screen with far more information than they typically need to do. In fact, I could make these much bigger again, but I thought, you know what, if it's on a smaller screen, um, on a laptop or something, maybe it'll be less. So I just kind of settled on this just so that I didn't overwhelm them with information because in general, you want your users to feel like they're not being overwhelmed. And sometimes that means making something bigger on the screen, letting the icon scale up and letting the user feel like they, they can wrap their head around the information that's in front of them at this particular point in time, especially for things like this because these terms are something they only set up once or, well, sorry, I guess three or four times a year, depending upon how they have the year scheduled. Um, so they don't come into the screen a lot. And because of that, I wanted the screen to be big and bold and obvious so that they wouldn't get suddenly overwhelmed by all these things and trying to squint to figure out which term they're in. Um, it, it's mostly about trying to make the user experience as pleasant as possible. And pictures are awesome. Icons are so capable and powerful. And I just thought this was a, this was a great way to do it. So uh, I, uh, because I just happened to add this little, um, uh, this little box onto my thing here. I happen to add this little list box control onto here to give me this extra stuff. I thought I'd show everybody how it works. And again, I'll, I'll put it up on the, uh, on the, uh, the GitHub repo so you guys can pull it down and play with it and uh, see what you think. John, you're gone. Is anybody there still? <laughs> gone, everybody left. <laughs> <laughs> I hope somebody closed the doors, turn off the lights. <laughs> We're still here. That's good. So th yeah, there's yeah. a little, little bit, a little bit of a departure that this whole webinar was in terms of talking about games a bit. But you know, we, we all play games every once in a while, and sometimes we sort of try and figure out how might you strategize this, strategize this a little bit differently, and thinking about how a computer might approach it is a kind of an intriguing yeah. concept. There's a fellow on YouTube. I'm trying to recall what his name is coding guru or something oh gosh but he he's he's just this weird wacky kind of guy and what he likes to do is he likes to write programs that that play games for him so he'll actually write a, a program that scrapes the screen as he's playing the game so that it watches for where a character is and then it actually controls the screen to try and control gameplay to get it to learn how to play something better uh, and and he'll spend you know, a week just sitting there coding, uh, and he'll use all kinds of, of uh, algorithms and learning, uh, machine learning and, uh, and uh, evolutionary logic and all kinds of neat stuff like that, uh, just so that uh, so that he can see what happens. And of course, he's he's goofing around while he's doing it. And I'll just sit there and watch one of this guy's videos, and they're like they're quite long, like twenty minutes long, twenty five minutes long. Uh, just, just to, he just has so much fun doing it. I just thought oh, I'm going to do the same thing myself, and or at least something like that. It's just take a game, and uh, and and try and extend upon it. So it, it was, it seemed like a fun thing to do for today. And then, fortunately, we had this little bit of extra time, and we could look at this icon thing as well. Yeah, nice, excellent. I'm going to grab the screen from you. All right. Well done, Mike. Thank you. Just uh, it, you you just go through it and you just you just know your stuff. You well, that's it well. kidding. It, 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 you know what, it's just, I, I have so much fun with it. Like I, I always approach, and everything I do, I try and approach as something that's amusing and entertaining and I try and do it with a, a sense of vim and vigor and passion and uh, it, it makes things fun. 
I'm, I've, I've always taken that approach and uh, people seem to appreciate that. Yes, we do. And we're, we're happy that you uh, come on and do these little sessions for us. That's very cool. Always, always uh, something I never think about and then all of a sudden I kind of think about it. <laughs> Hopefully so it doesn't that, hurt too much. Hopefully, my, my big concern with these things a lot of times is because everything is amazing to me, I know not everything is amazing to everybody else, and I'm always a little concerned that oh, this might be a little too esoteric for people, but I don't know. Let's go for it. I don't know. It's it, To me, it's just um, it's not something I'll use immediately, but you keep exposing me to this stuff, and then one day, one day I'm sure I'll go. I'm just planting seeds. Well, yeah, and, and just the idea of writing unit tests to test game logic is just not necessarily an obvious conclusion. But uh, uh, most times when I'm writing classes these days, I will write some amount of unit tests just to, to sort of get the ball rolling. Uh, sometimes I'll get to the point where I, you know, you're supposed to do a unit test and uh, write a unit test that's going to fail, and then and then write just enough code to get it to pass, and then and the the whole cycle for these things is supposed to be like five minutes. And I, I, I can't even imagine that. And, and you're never supposed to vary from that. And, and, and initially, it'll kind of feel that way. But at some point, I'll just suddenly shoot off and, and spend an hour writing some code. Uh, and haven't, and then I get to a point where I just think, oh, OK, I, what else am I going to unit test? There's nothing else. But this whole th big complicated thing is done now. But if I didn't have the unit test to begin with to make sure that I laid all the groundwork properly, all of that big complicated code would have driven me crazy because I would have been trying to debug all of this basic fundamental construction while trying to think in this very high level abstract stuff. It's nice when you can deal with the details at the really low level without sort of getting overwhelmed by the, the top level. And then once you have that great foundation, you can start playing on a more abstract level without worrying about it. It's kind of like it, it, when somebody hands you an airplane that you know is going to be safe, now go fly and have fun. All right. OK, I think we'll wrap up. Um, what do we got next week? Nothing. And the week after, nothing. And the week after, don't know. But sometime in May, Bruce will be doing Sequin 7. And he said he might need two sessions. He said it's pretty big. Mm. Wow. So, That's scary. Yeah, yeah I know. I, I don't, it could be good. I, I had written my own little security thing before I got Sequin years and years and years ago. But this seems like it's going to be a big enough update that I might end up using at least some of it for some things. We'll see. So I think it's supposed to have OAuth and stuff like that in it. Cool. Uh, is that right? Maybe. Well, OAuth isn't does involve security, so it does surprise me. Yeah, maybe a couple two-factor authorization stuff like that. Things we we need. So we'll see. I'm not. I'm just throwing words out. I don't know if this <laughs> is true or not. Guessing. <laughs> You're guessing. I'm guessing. I'm just, I think I might have heard people are talking. I don't know, you know, what's going on exactly, but we'll, we'll see. All right, that's it. We'll wrap up. Thanks, everybody. Uh, next week, All right. uh, normal stuff. Monday, Noyantis. Wednesday, open webinar. Thursday, net talk. Everybody, full schedule. So we'll see you guys around. Thanks, everybody. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. Have a good one. Happy Easter. Sure. Eat ham or turkey or rabbit or whatever you eat. <laughs> Mike, go, go back to playing games. I okay? <laughs> uh, can't top that one. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Uh, <laughs>